Nothing to Wear by William Allen Butler. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. Miss Flora Maflimsey of Madison Square has made three separate journeys to Paris, and her father assures me each time she was there that she and her friend, Mrs. Harris, not the lady whose name is so famous in history, but plain Mrs. H., without romance or mystery, spent six consecutive weeks without stopping, in one continuous round of shopping, shopping alone and shopping together, at all hours of the day and in all sorts of weather, for all manner of things that a woman can put on the crown of her head, or the sole of her foot, or wrap round her shoulders, or fit round her waist, or that can be sewed on, or pinned on, or laced, or tied on with a string, or stitched on with a bow, in front or behind, above or below, for bonnets, mantillas, capes, collars, and shawls, dresses for breakfasts, and dinners, and balls, dresses to sit in, and stand in, and walk in, dresses to dance in, and flirt in, and talk in, dresses in which to do nothing at all, dresses for winter, spring, summer, and fall, all of them different in colour and shape, silk, muslin, and lace, velvet, satin, and crepe, brocade and broadcloth, and other material quite as expensive and much more ethereal. In short, for all things that could ever be thought of, or milliner, modiste, or tradesman be bought of, from ten thousand franc robes to twenty sous frills, in all quarters of Paris, and to every store, while Maflimsy in vain stormed, scolded, and swore, they footed the streets, and he footed the bills. The last trip, their goods shipped by the steamer Argo, formed, Maflimsy declares, the bulk of her cargo, not to mention a quantity kept from the rest, sufficient to fill the largest sized chest, which did not appear on the ship's manifest, but for which the ladies themselves manifested such particular interest that they invested their own proper persons in layers and rows of muslins, embroideries, worked underclothes, gloves, handkerchiefs, scarves, and such trifles as those then, wrapped in great shawls like Circassian beauties, gave good-bye to the ship, and go-bye to the duties. Her relations at home all marvelled, no doubt. Miss Flora had grown so enormously stout for an actual belle and a possible bride. But the miracle ceased when she turned inside out, and the truth came to light, and the dry goods besides, which, in spite of collector and custom-house sentry, had entered the port without any entry. And yet, though scarce three months have passed since the day this merchandise went on twelve carts up Broadway, this same Miss Maflimsey of Madison Square the last time we met was in utter despair, because she had nothing whatever to wear. Nothing to wear. Now, as this is a true ditty, I do not assert, this you know is between us, that she's in a state of absolute nudity, like Power's Greek slave or the Medici Venus, but I do mean to say, I have heard her declare, when at the same moment she had on a dress which cost five hundred dollars and not a cent less, and jewellery worth ten times more, I should guess, that she had not a thing in the wide world to wear. I should mention just here that out of Miss Flora's two hundred and fifty or sixty adorers, I had just been selected as he who should throw all the rest in the shade by the gracious bestowal on myself, after twenty or thirty rejections, of those fossil remains which she called her affections, and that rather decayed but well-known work of art which Miss Flora persisted in styling her heart. So we were engaged, 
our troth had been plighted not by moonbeam or starbeam, by fountain or grove, but in a front parlour most brilliantly lighted beneath the gas fixtures, we whispered our love. Without any romance or raptures or sighs, without any tears in Miss Flora's blue eyes or blushes or transports or such silly actions, it was one of the quietest business transactions, with a very small sprinkling of sentiment, if any, and a very large diamond imported by Tiffany. On her virginal lips, while I printed a kiss, she exclaimed as a sort of parenthesis, and by way of putting me quite at my ease, "'You know I'm to polka as much as I please, and flirt when I like. Now stop, don't you speak, and you must not come here more than twice in the week. Or talk to me either at party or ball, but always be ready to come when I call. So don't prose to me about duty and stuff. If we don't break this off, there will be time enough for that sort of thing, but the bargain must be that as long as I choose I am perfectly free. For this is a kind of engagement, you see, which is binding on you, but not binding on me. Well, having thus wooed Miss Mflimsy and gained her, with the silks, crinolines, and hoops that contained her, I had, as I thought, a contingent remainder, at least, in the property, and the best right to appear as its escort by day and by night. And it being the week of the Stuck-Ups' grand ball, their cards had been out a fortnight or so, and set all the avenue on the tiptoe, I considered it only my duty to call and see if Miss Flora intended to go. I found her, as ladies are apt to be found, when the time intervening between the first sound of the bell and the visitor's entry is shorter than usual, I found, I won't say, I caught her, intent on the pier-glass, undoubtedly meaning to see if perhaps it didn't need cleaning. She turned as I entered. "'Why, Harry, you sinner! I thought that you went to the flashers to dinner.' "'So I did,' I replied. The dinner is swallowed, and digested, I trust, for tis now nine and more. So being relieved from that duty, I followed inclination which led me, you see, to your door. And now will your ladyship so condescend as just to inform me if you intend your beauty and graces and presents to lend, all of which, when I own, I hope no one will borrow, to the stuck-ups, whose party, you know, is to-morrow. The fair Flora looked up with a pitiful air, and answered quite promptly, "'Why, Harry, mon cher, I should like above all things to go with you there, but really and truly I've nothing to wear.' "'Nothing to wear? Go just as you are. Wear the dress you have on, and you'll be by far, I engage, the most bright and particular star on the stuck-up horizon.' I stopped, for her eye, notwithstanding this delicate onset of flattery, opened on me at once a most terrible battery of scorn and amazement. She made no reply, but gave a slight turn to the end of her nose, that pure Grecian feature, as much as to say, "'How absurd that any sane man should suppose that a lady would go to a ball in the clothes, no matter how fine, that she wears every day. So I ventured again, wear your crimson brocade. Second turn up of nose, that's too dark by a shade. Your blue silk, that's too heavy. Your pink, that's too light. Wear tulle over satin. I can't endure white. You're rose-coloured, then, the best of the batch. I haven't a thread of point lace to match. Your brown noir antique? Yes, and look like a Quaker. The pearl-coloured? I would, but that plaguy dressmaker has had it a week. Then that exquisite lilac, in which you would melt the heart of a Shylock. Here the nose took again the same elevation. "'I wouldn't wear that for the whole of creation.' 
"'Why not? It's my fancy there's nothing could strike it as more comme il faut.' "'Yes, but, dear me, that lean Sophronia Stuckup has got one just like it, "'and I won't appear dressed like a chit of sixteen. "'Then that splendid purple, the sweet mazarine, "'that superb point d'aiguille, that imperial green, "'that zephyr-like tarlatan, that rich grenadine. "'Not one of all which is fit to be seen,' said the lady, "'becoming excited and flushed. "'Then where,' I exclaimed, in a tone which quite crushed opposition, "'that gorgeous toilette which you sported in Paris last spring, "'at the grand presentation, when you quite turned the head of the head of the nation, "'and by all the grand court were so very much courted. "'The end of the nose was portentously tipped up, and both the bright eyes shot forth indignation, as she burst upon me with the fierce exclamation, "'I have worn it three times, at the least calculation, and that and most of my dresses are ripped up.' Here I ripped out something, perhaps rather rash, quite innocent, though, but to use an expression more striking than classic, it settled my hash, and proved very soon— the last act of our session. "'Fiddlesticks, is it, sir? I wonder the ceiling doesn't fall down and crush you. You men have no feeling. You selfish, unnaturally liberal creatures, who set yourself up as patterns and preachers. Your silly pretense! Why, what a mere guess it is! Pray, what do you know of a woman's necessities? I have told you and shown you I've nothing to wear, and it's perfectly plain— "'You not only don't care, but you do not believe me.' "'Here the nose went still higher. "'I suppose if you dared, you would call me a liar. "'Our engagement is ended, sir. "'Yes, on the spot. "'You're a brute and a monster, and I don't know what.' "'I mildly suggested the words hottentot, pickpocket, and cannibal, "'tartar and thief, as gentle expletives which might give relief but this only proved as a spark to the powder, and the storm I had raised came faster and louder. It blew and it rained, thundered, lightened and hailed interjections, verbs, pronouns, till language quite failed to express the abusive, and then its arrears were brought up all at once by a torrent of tears.' and my last faint despairing attempt at an observation was lost in a tempest of sobs. Well, I felt for the lady, and felt for my hat too, improvised on the crown of the latter a tattoo, in lieu of expressing the feelings which lay quite too deep for words, as Wordsworth would say. Then, without going through the form of a bow, found myself in the entry, I hardly know how, on doorstep and sidewalk, past lamp-post and square, at home and upstairs in my own easy-chair. Poked my feet into slippers, my fire into blaze, and said to myself, as I lit my cigar, supposing a man had the wealth of the Tsar of the Russias to boot for the rest of his days, on the whole, do you think he would have much to spare? "'if he married a woman with nothing to wear. "'Since that night, taking pains that it should not be bruited abroad in society, "'I've instituted a course of inquiry, extensive and thorough, on this vital subject, "'and find to my horror that the fair Flora's case is by no means surprising, "'but that there exists the greatest distress in our female community.' solely arising from this unsupplied destitution of dress, whose unfortunate victims are filling the air with the pitiful wail of nothing to wear. Researches in some of the upper ten districts reveal the most painful and startling statistics, of which let me mention only a few. In one single house on the Fifth Avenue, three young ladies were found all below twenty-two, 
who have been three whole weeks without anything new in the way of flounced silks, and thus left in the lurch, are unable to go to ball, concert, or church. In another large mansion near the same place was found a deplorable, heart-rending case of entire destitution of Brussels point lace. In a neighbouring block there was found in three calls total want, long continued, of camel's hair shawls, and a suffering family whose case exhibits the most pressing need of real ermine tippets. One deserving young lady, almost unable to survive for the want of a new Russian sable, still another whose tortures have been most terrific ever since the sad loss of the steamer Pacific, in which were engulfed not friend or relation, for whose fate she perhaps might have found consolation, or borne it at least with serene resignation, but the choicest assortment of French sleeves and collars ever sent out from Paris, worth thousands of dollars, and all as to style most recherché and rare, the want of which leaves her with nothing to wear, and renders her life so drear and dyspeptic that she's quite a recluse, and almost a sceptic, for she touchingly says that this sort of grief cannot find in religion the slightest relief, and philosophy has not a maxim to spare for the victims of such overwhelming despair. But the saddest by far of all these sad features is the cruelty practised upon the poor creatures by husbands and fathers, real bluebeards and tymons, who resist the most touching appeals made for diamonds by their wives and their daughters, and leave them for days unsupplied with new jewellery, fans or bouquets even laugh at their miseries whenever they have a chance, and deride their demands as useless extravagance. One case of a bride was brought to my view too sad for belief, but alas, t'was too true, whose husband refused, as savage as Charon, to permit her to take more than ten trunks to Sharon. The consequence was that when she got there, at the end of three weeks, she had nothing to wear. And when she proposed to finish the season at Newport, the monster refused out and out for his infamous conduct, alleging no reason except that the waters were good for his gout. Such treatment as this was too shocking, of course and proceedings are now going on for divorce. But why harrow the feelings by lifting the curtain from these scenes of woe? Enough, it is certain, has here been disclosed to stir up the pity of every benevolent heart in the city, and spur up humanity into a canter to rush and relieve these sad cases in stanter. Won't somebody— moved by this touching description, come forward to-morrow and head a subscription? Won't some kind philanthropist, seeing that aid is so needed at once by these indigent ladies, take charge of the matter? Or won't Peter Cooper the cornerstone lay of some new splendid superstructure like that which to-day links his name in the union unending of honour and fame, and found a new charity, just for the care of these unhappy women with nothing to wear, which, in view of the cash which would daily be claimed, the laying-out hospital well might be named. Won't Stuart, or some of our dry-goods importers, take a contract for clothing our wives and our daughters? or to furnish the cash to supply these distresses, and life's pathway strew with shawls, collars, and dresses, ere the want of them makes it much rougher and thornier, won't someone discover a new California? Oh, ladies, dear ladies, 
the next sunny day, please trundle your hoops just out of Broadway, from its swirl and its bustle, its fashion and pride, and the temples of trade which tower on each side, to the alleys and lanes where misfortune and guilt their children have gathered, their city have built, where hunger and vice, like twin beasts of prey, have hunted their victims to gloom and despair. Raise the rich dainty dress and the fine broidered skirt. Pick your delicate way through the dampness and dirt. Grope through the dark dens, climb the rickety stair to the garret, where wretches, the young and the old, half-starved and half-naked, lie crouched from the cold. See those skeleton limbs, those frost-bitten feet, all bleeding and bruised by the stones of the street. Hear the sharp cry of childhood, the deep groans that swell from the poor dying creature who writhes on the floor. Hear the curses that sound like the echoes of hell as you sicken and shudder and fly from the door. Then home to your wardrobes, and say, if you dare, spoiled children of fashion, you've nothing to wear. And, oh, if perchance there should be a sphere where all is made right which so puzzles us here, where the glare and the glitter and tinsel of time fade and die in the light of that region sublime, where the soul, disenchanted of flesh and of sense, unscreened by its trappings and shows and pretense, must be clothed for the life and the service above, with purity, truth, faith, meekness, and love. O daughters of earth, foolish virgins, beware, lest in that upper realm you have nothing to wear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.